would like to welcome our favorite self-hating patent lawyer. So welcome, Stefan. Hello, good to be here. My first pork fest, it's wonderful. Um, I think patent law, patent attorneys, it's a strange profession because I have a feeling if you're a cancer doctor, an oncologist, you probably don't get asked, how can you be paid to fight to eradicate something that would end your career? You know, they just don't get those questions. Uh, defense attorneys who are representing criminals accused of drug crimes don't get asked, you're against the drug war, how can you take money to try to help people in a system that you wouldn't even be paid to, that wouldn't even exist without the drug war? So patent law is kind of a strange thing to, uh, to be a libertarian and a patent attorney. I passed the patent bar in 1994, and I think in 1995 I published my first anti-IP article, so they kind of coincided. Um, learning a little bit about a topic makes you uh, see its flaws, if they have them. The title of my talk, I chose an, an intentionally uh, hyperbolic and, uh, 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 title, which is Intellectual Property, the Root of All Evil. Uh, this is a little bit exaggerated, but I want to buttress that claim a little bit. It's based upon the title of uh, Frank Chodorov's 1954 book, Income Tax, the Root of All Evil, which I admit gives IP a good run for its money and probably in some ways is really worse. Um, probably my, my real title should have been John Locke, the most evil man in all of history. <laughs> Just joking, we all know it's Immanuel Kant. <laughs> so what I want to do is explain why IP, by which I mean intellectual property law, which is a false name given to it by its proponents for patent and copyright and some other subsidiary uh, legal rules the state propounds and foists upon us patent and copyright primarily, but also trademark, trade secret, boat hole designs, database rights in some countries, moral rights, and an increasing array of rights, which I may get into if I don't see eyes glazing over too much. It's not too often you go to a campground in New Hampshire on a Friday night and speak about intellectual property. So, so I already give you a, a gold star. You're commended, to be commended. So what I want to show is that IP is one of the worst things the state does. It's a growing problem, and in a way, it's the most insidious and dangerous of all of the state evils, not in every respect, but in many respects. So let's talk about, we all know what the state evils are. And until 15 years ago, IP was not on this list because most libertarians didn't think about it, didn't recognize it, but it's obvious. War, the number one, the Federal Reserve, central banking, fiat money, Government schools, propaganda, government education, number three, taxation, and of course the drug war, which of all those has the least excuse uh, imaginable. Um, and I would put intellectual property up there in the big six, okay? Now, I've given this, not this talk, but I've given speeches about IP too many times at this point. You can look me up on YouTube or on my website if you want to get an in-depth talk about IP. I'm going to take it for granted that most people here are not for patent and copyright. Is there anyone here who wants to come up and I can give you a five minute lesson? No. So I will quickly summarize the case. First of all, the state is illegitimate. Second of all, legislation is not the right way to make law even if you have a state. Third of all, patent and copyright are total creatures of legislation just like the Americans with Disabilities Act or like the tax system. It could not exist without legislation, and it couldn't exist without the state. So that's a prima facie or an initial case uh, against uh, patent and copyright law. Copyright arose in response to the printing press. The government and the church feared people spreading information. They wanted to control it, and they did it with guilds and with proto-copyright law, which finally resulted in the Statute of Anne in 1709, which is the basis of modern copyright law. So copyright law is a state invention whose roots lie in censorship and thought control. It's a little surprising when we find libertarians who think copyright is a type of property right. It's a little disgusting, frankly. Um, patent arose even a little earlier in the practice of the crown, the sovereign, 
granting favors and monopoly privileges and protection to court cronies and favored industries. A patent was basically a statement by the king saying, only you can sell playing cards in this town. Okay? So it's not surprising, and, and that, that finally ter uh, culminated in the statute of monopolies in England in 1623. The word monopolies was used back then. You see the government used to be more honest about it was, what it was doing. We used to have a department of war, now we have a department of defense. Okay? At least they admitted it was a monopoly. If you tell a pro-IP libertarian now that they're in favor of monopolies, they go crazy. Okay? But they are in favor of monopolies. Okay. So intellectual property is now entrenched, patent and copyright especially. What I would like to do is, well, let me just explain quickly the problem with these views. I'm going to go into Mises a little bit here because Mises is one of my intellectual heroes along with Rand and Rothbard and the others. The basic problem with patent and copyright, other than the fact that censorship is unlibertarian and protectionism is unlibertarian, is that the libertarian idea is we want to live in freedom and prosperity and harmony with each other. We live in a world of scarce resources. We live in a world where we're born, we have to act. We have to use knowledge to act, and we have to use means to act. Means are scarce things in the world, tools, land, resources. These things, these scarce means are of such a nature that there can be conflict over them. Only one person can use these things at a time. And if there's not a normative system, a property system that says, who is the owner of this thing, this thing that there could be a dispute over, then there's going to be fighting, and we won't have society. We'll have warfare, and might makes right, and we won't have society or civilization. So property rights arise to address this problem that we humans face, which is scarcity in the world. It's all around us. Every action we take involves this. Every action we take also involves knowledge. We're intelligent, sentient creatures. We need to understand the world, comprehend it, have an idea about the causal laws, have an idea about the future, what's going to happen. And when we feel uncertain or we feel um, uneasy about what's going to happen in the future without our intervention, we think, hmm, I can use this means to get this thing done to make things better. That's what all human action is. Human action uses knowledge and it uses scarce resources. Property rights are only for scarce resources, and as Murray Rothbard has pointed out, all human rights are property rights, and all property rights are rights to control these scarce resources in the world. That's all they ever can be. A patent or a copyright is not actually a right to an idea. That's what it attempts to be. That's the justification given by its proponents. A patent or a copyright is really a disguised a redistribution or theft of property rights in already existing things. As a quick example, if you use my song without my permission, I can use copyright to sue you and the court will use its physical force to take some of your money and give it to me. So it's really about the money, okay? The same thing with patents. If I invent a new mousetrap and I have someone compete with me because they see that this mousetrap is popular, I can sue them and the court will use physical force enforced by government guns to take some of their money and issue an ongoing threat saying, and you may not make this mousetrap anymore even though it's with your property uh, on pain of government guns, physical injunction. So the, this is the basic argument against IP. It should be obvious at this point to every libertarian. What is not obvious is how bad the problem is. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is go into a few examples. I'll try to cut this as short as possible for Q&A because there probably, probably will be a lot. I'm not going to talk let – me, let me say what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to tell you how people would survive in a, in a patent or copyright-free world. The, the short answer to that is uh, your failed business model is not my problem. Okay? If I explain why slavery is wrong, a response to my argument is not, but who would pick the cotton? Okay? So if I tell you patent and copyright violate property rights, don't ask me, but how would music get made? That's because why don't you answer that question? How about you make some music instead of wasting time asking me this question? Okay. So that's not what I'm going to get into today, but I will be speaking on this topic in, in Hoppe's conference in Turkey in September, actually. Okay. The two main problems 
in quick summary, with the reasoning people use to justify AP, especially by libertarians, which is disheartening. Number one, the natural law property rights argument is based upon John Locke's idea that we own our labor. Okay? Now, that was the argument John Locke used to justify our self-ownership of our bodies and our ownership of things we acquire in the world or that we acquire by contract. He said that you own yourself because God gave it to Adam, Adam gave it to mankind. We own our bodies and ourselves, and therefore, if you own your labor, if you, if you own your body, you own your labor, and then you own things you mix it with, which is homesteading or appropriating unowned things in the world. His conclusion is correct. That's the libertarian conclusion. His reasoning is the problem. His reasoning is overly metaphorical, ambiguous, and imprecise. I don't blame him too much. It was a long time ago. He was a pioneer. But you do not own labor. Labor is just an action. You already own your body. That's what gives you the right to do, perform actions with your body. Labor is just a subset of action. It makes no sense to say you own your actions or to own your labor. You own your body. That gives you the right to perform actions. The second justification given for uh, patent and copyright is sort of a rear guard defense. That is, in response to criticisms, because people started noticing. In the 18th century, free market economists started noticing, well, there's something really strange that you're grafting onto this roughly free market property system in the US and in the West. You're grafting onto it these monopoly privileges of patents and these censorship grants of copyright. There's something strange about that. Uh, they were called monopolies at the time, or privileges. And so the response was, well, they're needed to encourage people to do things, etc. And another response was, well, they're, pro they're actually natural property rights. Okay? But these two responses, they're natural rights based upon Locke's overly metaphorical labor theory, which, by the way, a version of arguably led to the labor theory of value of Karl Marx and Adam Smith and David Ricardo, which led to communism, the deaths of hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century. But we can ignore that because we need a new iPad. Um, the utilitarian argument has led to this thinking we have now where we libertarians face it all the time. You talk to a normal person, they don't think in terms of principles. Everything is about utilitarian or empirical constraints. Oh, we need to have an incentive for this. The government needs to have funding for the arts. The government needs to uh, protect this infant industry here, okay, from, from competition from, from Japan, the steel industry, whatever, okay. Uh, the government needs to subsidize the arts and sciences with the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Academy of the Sciences, uh, etc. Now, this kind of thinking, I think what happened was it was a mistake. The, the founding fathers had a hunch. They thought, ah, let's throw this in there. We kind of have this weird copyright thing, the statute of monopolies for patents. Let's put that in the Constitution. And then let's let Congress do something with it, just to stimulate some kind of industry. We're a new country after all. They had a hunch. They didn't have a bunch of empiricist economists doing studies. They had no idea what they were talking about. Okay? So they had a hunch. It's going to improve innovation in the country. They passed it. These industries get entrenched by special interest. Whatever the equivalent of the pharmaceutical industry was at the time, I don't know, the buggy whip industry. You know, these guys now have an interest in monopolizing and cartelizing their field using patents. Publishers have an interest in maintaining their monopoly over publishing and printing using the copyright system. So these systems start to persist and become ingrained in the country. When they're subjected to criticisms by free market people and pro uh, proto-libertarians, classical liberals, their response is, oh no, it's a natural right, it's a property right. Let's make up a term. It's not patent and copyright. It's not privileges. It's not monopolies. It's an intellectual property right. It's just another type of property right. And this is one reason why I think that intellectual property is one of the most pernicious and dangerous of all the state uh, uh, institutions and policies that are dangerous. It's because unlike the others, most goodwill people, especially now in the aftermath of war, inflation, problems in the 70s, most people recognize even if you're in favor of taxation, you sort of know it's theft. Even if you're in favor of public education, you know there's something a little bit wrong with it. You know the government's educating the children. We all can point to war is obviously something that we want to avoid. Of all these government policies, only intellectual property flies under the banner of something we're in favor of and decent people are in favor of, which is property rights. So it's very insidious, and this is why it's so hard to convince people that if you're opposed to IP, that you're not some socialist or leftist who hates humanity. 
you know, in my view, actually, the reason to oppose IP is because you have a, a, a profound respect for, for property rights and for freedom and social interaction. There is no justification for any central agency to tell people what books they can publish. You know, books have been banned in the name of a copyright. A, a sequel to J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, a judge banned it. Uh, copies of movies have been banned. People have been ordered, there were some um, customers who accidentally, uh, there was a store who accidentally sold some copies of one of the Harry Potter novels uh, a few days early before release. And uh, the publisher went to a federal, a judge, a judge in Canada, and the Canadian judge sent an injunction to private citizens who had bought the book, ordering them not to read it or discuss it. I could give you a thousand examples which would blow your mind, and these examples come every day. I can't even keep track of it anymore myself. And these are all empirical examples. And when you give these examples, the defenders of IP say, well, you're just not giving a principled case against it, you're just pointing to examples. And every one of these examples you point to, I'll tell a defender of IP, well, what about this, what about this, what about this? And every time they'll say, well, I'm not in favor of that, I'm not in favor of that, I'm not in favor of that. I'll say, well, what the hell are you in favor of? Uh, they'll say, well, I'm not a specialist, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, are you in favor of the current patent system? No, don't accuse me of that. I said, well, do you want to abolish it? No, I'm not a communist. I mean, you can't get anywhere with these people, okay? Now, this thinking has really confused almost all the approaches to it. The more principled types, the natural rights types, like the objectivist, they do a version of Locke's view of labor, that we own our labor. They say that man creates values and he owns values. Now, I think this is total nonsense. We don't create values. We acquire resources and we use our intellect and our labor and our effort to improve their value to us. Value is a subjective phenomenon, as Mises, as Mises has explained. Okay? So when you increase wealth, that, what that means is taking something you already own and you improve it. I take wood and steel, I make a mousetrap. Now I'm wealthier but I haven't created a new property right. There's no value that's free floating out there that I own. We have to get rid of this idea that we own value, that value is an intrinsic thing, that it's, a, it's some kind of existing entity that can be owned. Remember, all rights are enforced by force of either some private system or the government, and it's always directed against physical objects, our bodies or the things that we actually manipulate and own. That's what physical force is. It always comes down to that. That's where the rubber um, hits the road. Okay? So let me give a few examples here before I... How much time do I have? Okay, I'll assume seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can't even go through all the examples I've collected. Uh, has anyone ever seen how uh, Louis Vuitton purses have the logo on the side? Yeah? You think that's normal. That's just a distortion of culture because there's no copyright in logos for fashion designs, so the, the, uh, the producers use trademark law, which is another type of IP right, to put on there so they can sue people for counterfeit. And then the libertarians who defend this say, well, aren't you against fraud? Like, so if a woman puts on makeup and looks five years younger, she's defrauding her date? I mean, if I buy a $20 Rolex, fake Rolex, Am I defrauded, or do you think I might have a clue that it's not a real Rolex? So I'm not defrauded. The seller's not defrauded. Who's defrauded? Rolex? Rolex had nothing to do with it. So they use these fake arguments all the time. Um, as you guys probably know, Aaron Schwartz, this is a couple of years old now, Aaron Schwartz actually committed suicide because he was being persecuted by the feds uh, for copyright infringement, facing prison time of your prison time. Uh, tra trademark is one of the least of the, the patent and copyright are the two worst. I go back and forth which one's worse. I mean, you tell me. Copyright threatens internet freedom and freedom of speech, and it distorts our, 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 our artistic culture. It doesn't really cost that much in dollar terms. It just distorts everything and threatens internet freedom. And I happen to think the internet's one of the most important uh, tools we have against the state in all of history. So I think that's pretty important in libertarian terms. The patent system probably imposes costs of, let's say, one, two, three hundred billion dollars a year at least on the U.S. economy alone, while distorting the economy, causing cartels, giving rise to oligopolies, reduced innovation, reduced competition. So it basically costs us a lot. 
we're basically poorer and we have a less innovative society now than we otherwise would have without patents. We're all much poorer. We pay higher prices for cell phones. There's a, all these patent taxes you don't even see. You know, Apple sues uh, Samsung. Samsung sues Motorola. One sues Google. They hire their patent lawyers like me. We make a lot of money off of it. We help them defend it. They spend tens, hundreds of millions of dollars a year on these patent lawsuits. There's a, a chart you wouldn't believe. It looks like the human neuron map or something. All these lawsuits going on between these companies. They don't care. They sue each other. The lawyers spend the money, and then they finally make a deal. Motorola and Apple make a deal. Google buys a Motorola division. What do they do? They say, okay, I'm going to pay you 20 bucks a phone for these 17 patents. You pay me 15 bucks a phone for, the, for these 38 patents, and we'll, we'll net it out, and then we'll go away. And then, of course, they just pass the cost on to the customers, and they can do that because they basically have a quasi-monopoly position because there's only three or four players that can afford to do this using the patents they've accumulated. Little guys can't compete. If I were to enter the field and try to compete with a brand new smartphone design, I'd be sued into oblivion. And I wouldn't be able to get any investors that are going to give me $17 million to defend patent lawsuits, which I probably would lose anyway because patents are valid. This is the other problem. People talk about patent reform. They say, we need to get, get rid of the bad patents. We need to get rid of software patents. We need to get rid of patent trolls. We need to improve the quality of the patents. We need to improve the patent office's budget. We need to stop the, the siphoning of funds off from the patent office going to the other agency of the government. After all, the patent office is self-sufficient. They're profitable. Yeah, they're actually profitable, like the post office. <laughs> well, they're giving a monopoly. They're, of course, they're profitable. Um, all these people miss the boat. The problem with the patent system is not the patent trolls. It's not the software patents. It's not the stupid patent examiners. It's not the inability to search the patent art for software. It's not the patents done by trolls who don't have their own products. The problem with the patent system is the good patents, the ones that can be used to extort other people and to keep out competition. This is the problem. Anyway. the. Uh, as a trademark example, as I said, it's number three on my list. Trade secret is bad too. Remember the Apple case when the uh, five? Okay. Remember when uh, the Apple employee left the iPhone 4 on a bar stool in California somewhere a few years ago? Well, there was a raid of the guy's apartment that had found it used by Apple with the police in tow under trade secret law, right? So there's a, here's an illegal search and seizure of someone's apartment. Remember, the guy didn't breach a contract and he didn't create any property violations. Apple abandoned their property, they were negligent, there's no contract. So even trade secret is bad. In trademark, you guys may have heard of uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, right? Eat more chicken, you know, their stupid little symbol that's misspelled, looks like dripping black cow blood for some reason. <laughs> misspelled M-O-R. There's some innocent guy named Bo Grease or something up in, he's up in New England somewhere. He sells Eat More Kale t-shirts. Spelled properly. He's been under siege by, uh, by Chick-fil-A's trademark lawyers for about three years now. He may lose his business because of this nonsense. This, ha this stuff happens all the time. Um, let me just give a couple of uh, empirical numbers that will just uh, blow your mind. First of all, there's been a study done by John Tehrani, a law professor, looking at copyright law, the way it works now. This is really not an exaggeration. This is the way it works. Because there's what's called statutory damages in the copyright system. There's $75,000, $155,000 minimum penalty per infringing act. Okay? It's, not even, it's not a measure of what d damage was done to the copyright holder. All of us, probably us more than the average person, just doing regular things, even if you're not using torrents and downloading pirated movies, just emailing each other, copying clips of websites, sending photographs, doing normal things everyone does with the internet and technology, uh, in principle, each one of us is potentially liable for up to $4.5 billion of damages every year just for living in this country, in this technical world. And of course, what does this do? It gives the state the discretion to selectively enforce it against their enemies, which is what they do. Um, so this is one reason why I think that IP is the root of all evil. We need to get rid of the labor notion that Locke has propounded, which has infected the Randian idea of the creation of values. That's not how property works. Creation is not a source of property, it's a source of wealth. 
We need to get rid of empirical and unprincipled thinking. We need to recognize that IP is a growing threat. As, as the digital world gets more and more important, the proponents of IP say that it's even more and more important. They're exactly wrong. They have it the other way around. As the, as the two things that contribute to human success are the scarce means we have, in principle, the capital resources we've built up, the factories, the tools, and the knowledge. The knowledge is, can be expand without limit because we can transmit it to each other. That's what's so beautiful about it. So we have two ingredients of successful human action and prosperity. Means of action, scarce resources, and knowledge. To have a law that tries to slow down the spread of knowledge, to try to penalize people for spreading this, building the corpus of human knowledge, is literally insane and malevolent and uh, uh, the most unlibertarian and evil thing you can almost think of. So I will close here and welcome your questions. Okay, first I'd like to give you something. All right. That's my CD. Thank you. When you take my CD or you download my music from the internet and then give it to someone else, you will have benefited by some degree and in some measure. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. So whether you get a smile or you get laid is irrelevant to me. I don't care. What I do want to know about is what kind of system or infrastructure or anything else are you and the other experts like you who believe the way you do, because I don't, I don't give a rat's butt about current copyright law. That's not what I'm talking about. What are you and the other people like you going to come up with to hold people accountable for having used my time and my labor to benefit. I th should I play back the entire 35 minutes? I mean, I just answered the entire thing. I just explained that that's the kind of question that I reject. Um, the, you, you benefited from others before. You've learned from other people before. So I guess the answer is I'm not going to do anything, right? I, I can be an attorney and help people with contracts, right? Uh, you can think of any industry you want. The fashion industry has no IP right now. They're making profits. You can knock off someone's perfume smell right now. They still make a profit, okay? Books, movies, paintings, music, we're used to copywriting these things, and people are relying upon these models. And by the way, it's 2015, CDs are gone. I sold you the experience, not the CD. So, and the reason I say that is there's a difference between you handing me or giving me a physical object with which there could be a contract. We could have a contract. There is one on the album, okay? That's not a contract. That's a, that's a fine point of law, which, which we can talk about. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different issue. But when I download something from the internet, I never touched or manipulated anything that you own. So I, you don't have the right to condition what I do with this information. Look, the, the answer I would give you is what Benjamin Tucker said over a century ago. He said, if you want to keep your ideas to yourself, keep them to yourself. So uh, my view is there are things that authors and artists can do but that's an entrepreneurial problem. And people like me and others are happy to work with you to help you do it, but not when it's directed as a challenge saying, basically, what your question is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I've heard this question 1,700 times. So the way I would summarize it is, unless you guarantee that I'm going to make X percent profit on my personal hobby or passion, then I'm going to be in favor of copyright and patent law. And I reject that. Okay, because there's no justification in patent and copyright law. So if there's an honest, separate question about how would artists survive, look, one example, this is, well, artists that sing and perform can make money off concerts. Now, if you give them this answer, they'll say, well, what if I'm a poet? So everything you give them, they will ask for another answer. You know, if you're a novelist like, uh, like uh, J.K. Rowling, 
You could sell your, 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 your right, you could, you could offer to consult on the movie version. Oh, there's three movie versions coming out on the second Harry Potter book, okay, because it's popular. And she can't stop anyone from making a movie because there's no copyright. She can say, I'll tell you what, I will, for $10 million, I will, I will review the script and I will put my name on there. There's ways people can make money. She could say, look at my million fans out there in the world. I have book number three ready. I'll release it as soon as I get three million people agree to give me $2 each off of Indiegogo or something. People have to use the new technology that's threatening them in their minds to benefit themselves. It's just an entrepreneurial issue. Anyway, let's move on. So you said that uh, intellectual property can only come from a legislative law. Do you, in fact, believe it's impossible Patent for... Patent copyright, anyway. Yes. Trademark did originate in the common law, and trade secret, too. Yeah. Do you believe it's impossible for these sort of intellectual property ideas to arise under a system of common law? For example, if someone writes a book and someone else sets up their own distribution of it, do you believe that it is impossible that a common law system would arise whereby the writer of the book could sue this distributor for damages? Yes, I think it's completely impossible for several reasons. And even if it's not impossible, then it would just be illegitimate. Then the common law would just be unjust, as it is often unjust today, because it was, after all, a quasi-state system or a state system. It was just decentralized, so it had advantages over legislation as the way of making law. But it's still a government system. So you could imagine some judges doing something crazy, having a crazy decision, and just announcing from the court, we think there's a right to copy, you know, this kind of right. They could say, we think there's an American, there's a right to be free from discrimination if you're handicapped. They could legislate the ADA from the bench. But the way the common law works is that kind of decision, first of all, it would be viewed as what's called dicta, over to dicta, a saying that the judge is making that's outside of what he had to say to, dis to resolve the dispute. Every case in a common law system is a dispute between two actual people withstanding and they have a real dispute between them and the judge's job is to make a decision or the jury between those two people. He can't make a general law applicable to everyone else. And if his decision is crazy, other judges will just disregard it. If it makes sense and is a workable solution, over time it will accrete to the body of law. That's how the common law develops. So I think it's totally impossible. And the proof of that is that these are these are statutes. It took the US first of all the US is based upon a constitution which is just legislation. We don't like to think of it as that. We think of it as our Bible or something. But it's nothing but legislation, which was part of a, a coup, coup d'etat in this country, centralizing the state, giving cover to the state. The constitution was ratified in 1789. 1790, the Congress passed the co first copyright and patent acts. So there are legislation that followed directly from another piece of legislation which followed from the statute of Anne, which is legislation in England, and the statute of monopolies in England. So it's, it's inconceivable to my mind that, to imagine this arising um, in a decentralized legal system. Thank you. Stefan, I'm interested in the uh, strategies of the state and the future strategies of the state. And I'd like for you to comment if, if you're aware or if you're not. Um, there was a bill this uh, past year, or they were trying to get it through, where that if you violated copyright, you could be held under terrorism laws and held accountable under terrorism laws. And I'm just curious if you're, if you're not aware of that and if you can comment about where you think the state is going to take IP law in the future to ratchet up a la Robert Higgs. Oh, you, by ratchet up, you, Bob Higgs, you mean Higgs's ratchet effect, right, where right. state where, law tends to increase. Yeah, where the, st the state uses the law and legislation to increase its powers. Yeah, which is similar to Mises' observation that state regulations usually mess things up and require more regulations, so controls breed controls, as Mises would say, right? Uh, I don't know if I remember, that sounds familiar, what you're talking about, uh, using copyright combined with a terrorism charge. What you may be thinking of is the 3D printing uh, files of uh, Cody, Cody Wilson, right? And the state has basically threatened him with, and I didn't get a chance to get to this in the talk, but th this kind of law is an example of why IP is in cities because to my mind it's like a patent or copyright type law. The federal government is basically using its export, import, and anti 
anti-terrorism technology control laws to say you're exporting uh, uh, basically a hostile, uh, I forgot the term, hostile product because it's information, like if you have a, the, the recipe for a gun, right? So it's very similar to copyright. It's just in this case, instead of a private party having the copyright or the patent, it's the federal government claiming this copyright or patent. They just don't call it a copyright or patent. Uh, so I think the government tries to use this mentality to expand its control. And you could think of any number of laws as IP-like. The drug war is IP-like. The government's telling you what you can do with your property, which is what patent and copyright law allow people to do. Um, you know, I think there was a case I read recently about the NSA suing someone under a federal criminal statute for using their logo on their, uh, on their website, which is normally what a trademark claim would be like. But it wasn't called a trademark claim. It's a federal criminal uh, statute. So there's all kinds of IP-like provisions, and I think the government's getting worse and worse. The worst thing is that they're exporting this to the rest of the world. I think Canada just increased their copyright term by 20 years under arm twisting by the U.S. so that Canada can be part of the TPP negotiations. It's the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is probably going to pass because Obama twisted the arms of the Republican sellouts in the, in the Congress to pass the, uh, the TPA, that allow, you know, the uh, Fast Track Authority. So TPP is coming. It's going to ratchet up IP protection around the world, copyright and patent. Uh, it's just going to get worse and worse. The only saving grace is that the state's getting more and more desperate, and they have to hide these things more and more. And with the rise of encryption technology and the kind of the Bitcoin stuff, we talked about this on Ernie Hancock's show this morning a little bit, uh, it's going to get easier and easier for people to evade the state's control by just going underground through some kind of dark net or some kind of encryption. So my hope is that copyright and even parts of patent law will be increasingly unenforceable. That's a practical matter. In a world without patents, wouldn't, I, I know you dream this a lot, but wouldn't there be a burgeoning industry in ba of, of back engineering firms? And wouldn't a company like Apple have to charge you actually more because the life of their product would be less because if somebody else would come out with uh, a copy sooner? But yeah, by back engineering, you mean reverse engineering, which reverse is engineering. which you yes. can do. Which you can do now. You just couldn't sell the product that you reverse engineer. I mean, right, part of the in, in this world, you would be able to do that, and that would limit the lifespan of the product that Apple or other companies. Which means produce. Apple would have to innovate more. I mean, they'd also have to charge more to be able to make up the, the, their cost, initial it, cost. I don't think that's true from just my experience with the industry. But even if it was. Well, you know, I'm actually a libertarian and believe in free market competition. So I, I, I don't see a problem with companies competing with each other and having to compete. Uh, every time a new business model comes up or a new product, if it's successful, what does this do? It sends a, it sends a signal to the market by the price system and it signals to people like blood in the water to sharks, hey, Here's an opportunity to make a profit. You gotta remember, profit is an unnatural thing. The market's always tending towards equilibrium, right? Profit always gets eroded down to the interest rate. If you make a profit, you can't count on that forever. You can't sit on that. So when you make a profit, you're gonna expect interest to come compete with you. This is the market process. This is why we have progress. I see nothing whatsoever wrong with people competing with, with, with others. And not only that, if you understand the way the patent system works, it's completely non-objective and arbitrary. Uh, so Apple made a smartphone. So do they own smartphones or do they own roughly rectangular ones or ones with, with a touch screen or with a touch screen with too much of the surface? That's the job of people like me to write these complicated legalese paragraphs and patents using the state's legislative system that no one else understands. No one else understands. And it's completely unjust and arbitrary, nothing to do with the real world. It's just an arbitrary line drawing basically by a court or by a bureaucracy of the government. So some competition's allowed and some is not. I think all competition should be allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So my question is, how do we begin to limit the scope of IP in this country? So I understand your arguments and you know I think we live in an age where a lot of industries are more open to this. You look like companies like Google and Tesla that taken somewhat more of a looser IP stance, and I even think with copyright, there's some straightforward answers which you kind of brushed upon looking at the patri uh, patron system. But really, the big you know, adversary here is the pharmaceutical companies. 
you know, they have 10 year long regulatory periods plus, you know, $5 billion per successful drug, including the failed ones. You know, how do we start to take away at that? Do you think there's some, um, some over, you know, washing system that we can target? Do you think we just, you know, have to, you know, hold back the, the walls by looking at the most egregious offenders like Myriad? Or do you think that possibly we can start targeting and peeling back the scope by looking at things like reformulation and repurposing of uh, prior art? I think the internet helps because it's publicizing on a daily basis these outrageous uh, examples. The problem is people don't have a principal framework to look at it through, right? So they'll see a bad example and they'll think, well, that's part of the balance. We have to do a balance. This is part of this, this is the problem with this utilitarian mentality we have now. Everything's a balance. Yeah, we need free competition, but we also need to have people have a guarantee to get profits uh, off of their, uh, you know, so, it's, it's, so we just have to have a balance. And of course, it's up to Congress or the courts to do the balancing, right, or the voters, which is completely outside of the free market. Um, I think it's, the, the problem is the same public choice problem, that this is pushed by people with special interests, right? They concentrated interests. Most people don't see the problems. They see all the good things we have, all the high tech. So they're not really fighting this. And they've been deluded into thinking this is part of the property rights system of American Western capitalism. So all I can think is we can keep educating people, showing them examples, and hope that eventually the courageous, you know, entrepreneurs and the people that don't, they're not always as cowed by the state, will just evade the state's regulations using technology. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm ambivalent. I had a patent filed out, but I never actually filed it. Um, but I was going to use his example of the pharmaceutical industries. You know, if they spend like a half a billion dollars developing a pill, um, you know, they going to want to protect that from some company just copying it, copying the pill. So I was wanting to ask you, do you think that anarchy and intellectual property are mutually exclusive? I'm not, I don't think they are. I think that there will be a market for intellectual property because, you know, anybody who invests that much into like one product, they'll also be willing to pay a pretty penny to dissuade competitors from entering the market as well. So whether it's you know um, their rights enforcement agency or whatever, um, I think that there will still be a market for intellectual property. So do you think they're mutually exclusive? Okay. So, uh, so uh, yes, I think they're mutually exclusive. But let let me address that. Um, first of all, yes, people don't want competition, but that's natural. People are willing to pay a pretty penny sometimes. You know, if I have the only pizza joint in town and someone else is going to open up a competing joint across the street and steal some of my business, right? This is how people think about things in terms of using possessives as arguments. Um, then they might bribe their mayor buddy to deny the permit for the competitor across the street. They might want to do that. There might be a market for hitmen in a free market too but that doesn't justify it, okay? So that's the first thing. Intellectual property is a term we have to define precisely if you're gonna have this kind of discussion. It's used at least in three ways. Number one, it's used to discuss the just knowledge people have. This is a common colloquial way that engineers and, and businessmen use. They'll say, you know, this process I have is my IP. As to an IP lawyer, that's not what it means. That's just knowledge. They have their knowledge, that's fine. IP means the legal rights protected by the state in patents and copyrights primarily. It also is used sometimes to refer to a contractual mechanism people could and would and should use to do a little bit of what you're pointing at, but that's not IP, that's a contract, and this gets into legal theory, but there's a difference between a contract right, which only binds people to the party to the contract, and what's called a property right or an in rem right that's good against the whole world. The fundamental problem with patent and copyright is that they're in rem rights, they're property rights, that's what they call that, good against the world. They bind people that weren't parties to it. This is the problem with libertarians who just trot out the contract word or the fraud word to justify property systems because fraud, I mean fraud and contract are not the basis of a property system. There are implications of it. Now, on the pharmaceutical situation, first, for anyone who's interested, I would refer you to the empirical work by Bolger and Levine. It's for free online at againstmonopoly.org. Their book, Against Intellectual Monopoly, chapter nine, deals in detail with all the fallacies implicit in some of your, your assumptions. But one of them is libertarians, it's easy to see is, the reason, the, FD, uh, the, reason the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies have such high costs is because of the FDA process, which the federal government has also foisted on the country. 
wouldn't a better solution be instead of saying we know the federal government has increased cost and reduced our welfare it's made these companies have a very hard time uh, making profit, uh, making a profit because the cost is so high because of the FDA process and by the way the FDA process also requires companies to publicly reveal their secrets way before the drug is approved so by the time they're ready to go into production all their competitors have been studying their information for years so they can go into production right away so what's called the first mover advantage is lost because of the FDA process and so then the government swoops in as a white knight and says oh we know that you're really suffering in this horrible costly system which we caused we're gonna save you by giving you a monopoly on your invention to protect you from competition for another 17 years okay so I think the better solution would be instead of adding one layer of government controls and costs taxation system regulations tariffs minimum wage uh, environmental laws all these things that just impose crushing costs on these pharmaceutical companies instead of just throwing them a, a lifeline of a patent which is another government control why don't they just reduce all the costs and then the government doesn't have to come in and save them in the first place I try to be a principled anarchist, but uh, I'm also, I try to be a practical businessman. And in industries where uh, traditionally people are using copyrights, patents, trademarks, and or they can use them against you, uh, what do you recommend as a, a practical tool uh, or what positions or actions should we take given the That's, current yeah. environment? I've heard that question many times. I actually. I wrote, I wrote a little monograph for Jeff Tucker's Liberty.me. It's called Do Business Without Intellectual Property, and it's online for free on my website. I guess some practical solutions there. Your question is not really a practical one. It's more of an ethical, moral one. It's, this is a lifestyle question. If you're a libertarian, you're living in an unfree world, and if you want to try to live ethically, what should you do? I, I don't pretend to be an expert on that. I have some opinions, of course. I, personally, in my life, I've always refused to be on the... Uh, the aggressive side of a patent litigation. I have no problem representing someone to the hilt if they're, if they're attacked for patents. I, I would help a client countersue or do anything. But I would not personally be part of that. People that do that, I don't know if I can blame them. That's a personal morality question. I think you shouldn't do it. I think it's wrong to sue someone for copyright infringement. I think it's wrong to sue someone for patent infringement if they're not aggressing against you. That's my personal view. If you have those kind of personal scruples, you're going to be hurt a little bit in the market because no, everyone else doesn't, right? So it's going to cost you. But then there's other things you can do to try to ameliorate that. And, and to respond to one other question someone had about things you can do, I mean, Twitter and what Tesla, some of these companies have, they've tried to get rid of the burden of patents on them. Twitter signed an agreement with all of its employees where they limited their right to sue people for patents aggressively. Their employees can block it, basically. So they're trying to tie their own hands to show people we're not going to be patent aggressors. Tesla has quasi-open sourced all of its patents, so they have more competition, so that the market for electrical vehicles thrives, so they have a chance to survive in a world that might have an electrical vehicle market. And, and, and I didn't give them this idea. Some patent, some libertarian patent attorney, I mean, they had to think of this themselves as, as entrepreneurs, perhaps thinking a little bit morally. Um, so anyway, that's the answer to that. A good talk. I, I agree with you that um, simply uh, creating something is not sufficient uh, for ownership. You know, uh, for instance, you know, I'll uh, maybe uh, create flatulence and that's not sufficient, you know, and maybe I worked hard for it. I had to eat a lot of beans and those cost money. Um, but uh, my question is uh, sort of to be influenced uh, by Evan when I give my talk. Uh, you gave examples of cur current implementations of the egregiousness of uh, patent and copyright law, but why does that matter? You know, I think a libertarian could say, you know, yes, just because it's implemented badly doesn't mean that I agree with its implementation, and that's not a sufficient. Critique. I agree totally. It, it, it's theoretically possible for some current law to be just, even though its origins are tainted, right? Uh, the reason I mention it is because it's helpful to know history, and because no one understands the history properly. They think that the founding fathers were some kind of uh, benevolent, uh, you know. Uh, legal geniuses who just thought, oh, we, we have to have this, but they didn't. To understand how it arose is important. Uh, there, actually, one interesting fact I found out, which I didn't know until recently, was when Jefferson was consulting uh, with Madison on the Bill of Rights, 
ratified in 91, Jefferson, and remember in 1789, the Constitution already had a clause authorizing patent and copyright. 1789, the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. Two years later, during this, during this negotiation, Jefferson proposed to Madison that another clause be added to the Bill of Rights, right, to the most important thing, one of our most important documents, which, which said that the government, it was gonna limit this, it said the government has the right to grant these patent and copyright monopolies, but only for blank years. And he wanted the, you know, the, the, the Congressional Assembly to put a number in, like 14 years or something. They didn't do that. If they had done that, then the copyright term wouldn't have been able to have been expanded from the original 14 years to 28 and then to 56 and then to 70 and now to life of the author plus 70 years, which is over a century, which is what's happening now to every work that we create. When you send someone an email right now, you know, you're, you're, it's going to be copyrighted for 100 years. Um, so I think the history is important to know. Anyway, I find it interesting. Yeah. Um, you were talking a little bit before about how the little guy gets kind of bogged down by the big folks who own all those pets and stuff like that, but what I, I have a scenario in mind that I'd like you to respond to. Basically, if I'm a small businessman and I've got an idea for a product, and let's say I keep that stored on a computer and stored on the CD in my office, and the office is locked up, and I'm working to get investors so I can build a factory and build my widgets, or whatever they are. Somebody else breaks in, steals the CD, takes it to their own factory, makes their stuff, and sells it for millions of dollars. As far as I can tell, with intellectual property, the only restitution I'm entitled to is two bucks for a CD. Is there any other way that I could get any more restitution, or is that how it's going to be? Well, I've written a little bit on this. I mean, the problem is the law is not too developed because the law has gone down the path of the current statutory systems and legislation. Uh, so we have to sort of imagine what we think would develop. And I'm always trying to be cautious about being an armchair libertarian predicting exactly what's going to happen. However, given common law precedent that I'm aware of and property theory and contract theory, for example, from Rothbard and others, you know, my view is that would be viewed as a trespass. It's a trespass against an owned resource, the, the office or the computer. So there's a trespass committed, which is a, an offense under libertarian theory. Right. So then the question is, what are the damages? That's a restitution issue. Yes. And I do believe that the, the, the consequences that befall the victim of a, of a tort like that um, matter in determining how much restitution or rectification should be paid. So for example, if I borrow your car for without your permission for an hour's joyride and I return it completely in good condition, or if I borrow it and I, I crash it or explode it, I think that the amount of money I would have to pay you would be different because the consequences of that trespass are greater to you. So I think some kind of system like that would be worked out. And there are cases that, uh, there's the, the Covey versus CompuServe case where there's called cyber trespass cases. Just go to my website and search spam and trespass and I've got some ideas on that. Hi, Stefan. Um, first, I'd like to oh. thank you. Uh, you brought, changed my views on IP through your arguments, so I thank you for pursuing this and trying to share this knowledge. Um, it's related to the last questioner, uh, I think a situation that's increasingly coming up, especially with computers and the internet, is if you have someone who's violated property, they've taken some data off a computer, and then they go and reshare it, whether that's a personal journal or a song or a naked picture. Um, do you think that the recipient and any further recipients have any ethical or legal um, uh, duty to not receive that data, or is it just Sim open simple, season? Simple answer. I think there's an ethical obligation usually, unless the information is so public that it's ubiquitous now and it doesn't matter. I mean, child pornography is another case. I mean, it's abhorrent. But legally, no. I think information is not an ownable thing, and, and uh, there's no contract with these third, fourth removed parties, and there's no property right in information per se. So no, I, I don't think so. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.